five by five. All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. We're in week two. Uh, you guys survived your first week. Uh, everything seems to be going well. I uh, was able to grade the, the uh, main project for everyone who turned it in last night, and uh, I was very, very pleased. I've got uh, some really great papers, and I, I can see that you guys really get it. You're, you're a very smart crew, and you, you follow instructions. You have uh, great ideas. I'm, I'm very pleased with what I saw. Uh, there's some of you that still haven't got it turned in. That's okay. We're going to allow you to turn it in uh, uh, for the next couple of days. So uh, if you did not get the main assignment done, uh, you can still turn it in today or tomorrow up to Wednesday, and then we'll cut it off. Uh, but don't spend too much time on it because any time you spend on it this week is time you're taking away from the activities for week two, for which we're going to begin. Uh, this week is where we're going to move on from the general notion of what is a presentation to start to working on our main project. Uh, we're going to have one main project for the rest of the, uh, the month. We're going to plan it this week. You're going to create it next week and you're gonna revise it in week four. So we'll all be working on that. And then uh, there's also uh, a really fun project in the discussion this week that I need to explain to you, and I'll go through that in detail as well. Uh, the reading this week, we expand it. We, finish, we do a couple more chapters of Resonate, but now we have assigned you some chapters from Slideology, the other book as well. Uh, and so uh, again, uh, because we're experiencing some difficulties with the uh, uh, O'Reilly site, let me know if you guys are having any problems accessing those books or reading them or they don't make any sense. The reading is not quite as, as intense or intense, uh, uh, in, uh, intense this week as it was last week. Last week we were just getting started. This week we're just expanding on that and we are focusing on the theme of planning, pre-production, how do we get started? So in Slideology, uh, one of the chapters was called The Five Theses of the Power of Presentation. And that was Nancy's first attempt to say, what is special about presentations? What can you do with them that uh, you, you can't do in other kinds of um, uh, uh, projects that you create? And so uh, the first one is, is an idea that we've heard of and we're gonna hear again many, many times. And that is that you can focus in on a special audience, that you, the audience is the king, is what you're uh, specifically making this for. So we don't wanna make to whom it may concern type presentations. We wanna know who our audience is and we wanna tailor make our presentations to meet their needs, to know what it is they're looking for, what are their persuadable points. Uh, and, and as you guys get into um, working professionals, uh, you're going to be in meetings with colleagues, so you'll know exactly who you who the people in the meetings are, and uh, you know you probably want it to satisfy those people's concerns as regards perhaps their job titles. You know, the, when you're talking about something job related, if the project manager is in the meeting, he want to know that you're going to be on time. If the uh, lead programmer is there, you want to know what issues there are that, that have to do with programming and. You know, a budget person will, will want to know those things. So you want to know who you're talking to and you want to address those concerns. That's what a presentation is all about. It's being as specific and tailored to your audience as you can be. Uh, presentations are meant to spread ideas. They're meant to go viral. So if they're short and sweet and they really hit the target of where you want to go, then there's something that, that can move around and play with a lot of people. And that's, again, uh, meaning that we want them to be short so that they fit everyone's agenda. Uh, and and as, long as, you're, as long as they're long enough to get the point across, as long as you're giving all the relevant information, the shorter the better, because that's going to make sure that people are interested, people are gonna be plugged in and watching. Um, we want to make sure that multimedia is involved. We want to add visuals. We want to help them see what you're saying. So you want to explain yourself. You want to talk well. You want to express yourself through your voice. But then you want to use the visuals to help people understand what you're saying and perhaps to uh, color your words or give 
specific meaning to some things that are possibly open to interpretation on language. And then finally, uh, we want to make sure that our images are communicating. They aren't just pretty pictures. We're not practicing decoration. We are using images to communicate that it's designed and that we think about the relationships that are involved in a presentation. If you're presenting live, the pre presenter has the, uh, a relationship with the audience and you can sort of read the room and know that they're understanding you or not, or if they're with you, or you need to uh, amp up your energy level or, or bring more humor or stop saying bad jokes, or you, know, you have the ability to uh, get live feedback in a live presentation. Now, uh, pre-recorded presentations like we're going to create, you have to anticipate all that. So the planning becomes all the more important. But there's still relationships involved there because you have a soundtrack that is giving one layer of information and you have a visual track that accompanies it. And what is the, uh, what is the relationship? What is the sync? What is the um, uh, back and forth between the visuals that we're seeing and the audio that we're hearing? And does, do the visuals keep us focused on the voice or do they distract? These are all things to think about. These are things to work on in the planning. So planning is what we're all about this week. We are going to start creating presentation. Pretty soon I'm gonna give you the topic and we're gonna start, start thinking about the big presentation I'm gonna have you make. And so this is the week that I want you to create a plan for it. And so in the, uh, in the reading this week, Nancy Duarte sort of posits out what she believes the presentation ecosystem for, um, consists of. Now, um, most creative arts have a, a, a particular workflow. I think everyone's familiar with sort of the way the movies work. And uh, it comes from, you know, classic Hollywood where there's always been a period of pre-production, production, post-production. Post and because movies were very expensive, because in the old days, uh, shooting film was a chemical process and it, it involved, you know, uh, time and, 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 and structure and everything, you had to do a lot of you know, the work ahead of time in planning. In pre-production, you write the script, you pick the actors, you make the sets, you. You, you hire all the technical people, you figure out all the issues and make sure that everything's worked out because when you're in production, that's a very intense period and it's usually very expensive in film production. So you want to make sure that um, you've planned it down to a T. You're, you're making maximum use of your time and you're not extending those dates as long as, uh, uh, you know, any longer than you have to because it's very expensive uh, and therefore, you want to get all of the filming done that you can. In the old days, because you had to develop film, you didn't even know if what you shot one day was good until you saw the developed film the day after. Um, and then the post-production part is after the filming is over, you have all your film created, collected, you have to put it together, you edit it, you put it together with the soundtrack, you add all the effects, uh, you do all of the finishing work that makes it a completed film. Now, the same process applies to filmmaking and lots of other creative processes today. What makes it a little bit confusing and what makes it important for me to talk about this as a, a regular structure is that everything that we're talking about now happens on the same device, on your computer. You know, uh, used to be that if you were writing a script, that was on a typewriter. If you were filming uh, the actors, that was with a camera. If you were editing video, that's what an editing machine. Well, now that all happens on your laptop. And so you can sometimes work in a disordered fashion. But what that does is it leads to a disordered product. And if you follow these tried and true patterns of trying to get all your pre-production done, work done ahead of time, before you move into production and try to get all your assets collected together before you start assembling them, then you're better off. Uh, now, in, in, in the modern age, when you're working digitally, if you have to rewrite at the last minute or you have to create a new asset right in the minute uh, on the finishing stages of, 
of assembling it, you can do that. That's one of the beauties of, of, of digital workflow. But you don't want to make that a habit. You want to make that a special fix. Because if you follow a standard workflow, then your ideas become much more uh, thought out. You are um, addressing needs that you might overlook otherwise. Think of it like uh, a pilot taking off on a plane. Every time that pilot takes off, he goes through a checklist. And he's flown before. You know, he could, he could, he could wander in at the last minute and turn on the buttons and, and maybe get okay. But there's always a chance he'll forget something. And, and when it's really important, you don't want to, you don't want to mess up. So follow a checklist. And if you, if you go through a regular pre-production phase, that assures that you don't overlook something very important. And like we say, the, the basis of most bad PowerPoints is that people start making slides before they know what they want to say. And if you go through a proper pre-production process, then you will have worked out all of those issues. And that's what we want to get you guys into a regular habit of doing. So in Nancy Duarte's world, the three stages of um, uh, pr the presentation system is the message track, the visual track, and the delivery track. And they each have their own elements. I want to go through them as briefly as I can. In the message track, the first thing you have to figure out is who is my audience? Who am I talking to? What do I have to convince them of? What, do, what, I, what are the references that I need to come up with to, to appeal to them? Uh, what is the messaging that they're, they're susceptible to? What is the aesthetic that they are looking for? The more I know about my audience, the more I know what I can create. The next phase is ideation. This may be a word you haven't heard before, but uh, it's because it's been replaced by uh, a slang term that we all love much more, brainstorming. There needs to be a brainstorming phase at the beginning of every project or else you're cutting yourself off from ideas. Um, you guys need to, 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 ideation is the act of generating ideas. And you guys need to build a habit of brainstorming at the beginning of every project and making sure that you've really applied yourself. Most of us um, don't spend enough time at it. It's like doing a Google search. Uh, you get lazy and you take the first choice or you don't want to go past the first page. Even though there are a million results, you don't want to take the time to really evaluate them. But if you really want your project to do well, you really should spend more time brainstorming. Uh, there are actual rules for brainstorming. We want to talk about them. But I want you to all go through a brainstorming process at the beginning of this project in which you generate ideas for your project and write them down. That's the plan. That's the assignment that you're going to have this week. You're going to turn in a plan to me with a lot of ideas, maybe that you don't even use, but you're, you've thought about it. You've thought about what can go into this project. Because I don't want you to start making the presentation without having done this, without having done the thought work of generating the ideas. And if you push yourself in this brainstorming fashion a little bit beyond your normal comfort zone, you'll find that brainstorming just a little bit longer, not settling for the first idea that you get or even the second idea, but pushing a little further, that you're gonna come up with more and better ideas. So brainstorming is something that you can do to prove yourself as an artist. Every time you're in a project, no matter what you're working on, if you extend that period of free form brainstorming, you're gonna generate more ideas and you're gonna have a better quality of options to choose from. Now, uh, once you've generated all these ideas, they aren't all good. You're gonna to have to go in and you're gonna pick the best ones. And that begins a process of writing, which begins with editing all these wild ideas together and putting them into a form and learning to tell a story. We're gonna to have to put these into a beginning, middle and end. We're gonna tell a story with all these ideas that we've generated, all these things we're gonna to have to say about our project. But until we've generated those ideas, we don't have anything to work with. So I know a lot of times uh, you guys are really reluctant to do this pre-production phase. And even when I ask you to write a plan, 
you'll just say, well, I'll talk about my early days. No, I want you to actually put a lot of anecdotes in there and then you can choose amongst the ones you want to use. But putting off a decision that is uh, about what's going to go into the project just makes you uh, lose time in the work. Right now is the week where we want you thinking about something other than actually generating or, or, or creating the project. And this is the time when you can actually uh, let your mind run deeper and find those great ideas. And so we want to put them into a form. Uh, there are different tools we're gonna to use. A lot of people use, just write in Word or they use a notepad. Uh, sometimes people write in uh, 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 journals. Uh, there are digital tools and there are uh, paper tools. But once we've written a script and we know what we wanna say, then uh, you know, that becomes the voiceover. That becomes what the speaker has to say. And then we move on to the second leg of this track, the visual story. That's the visual element that's gonna accompany what is the story that you've created. And the visual story, there's brainstorming that goes on as well. You're gonna to have to think about, uh, you know, what are some of the images you're gonna use? What is some of the, the language we're gonna put uh, forth? And uh, what is the look that we're going to create? And again, there are various tools that you can use. There's storyboarding, there's sketching, uh, there are uh, tools called mind mapping that allows us to do visual things with words that allows us to uh, uh, create the language we need. And in addition to that kind of visual thinking, we need to think about what are the images we're gonna put in our production. And um, you know, here again, you don't wanna be that guy that chooses the first choice in a Google search. You wanna push it. You wanna make it uh, something that you're putting extra effort in, that you're more proud of. Um, in PowerPoint, they, they, it comes with uh, uh, cheap cartoon clip art, and it's really easy to just go and select that. But what does it say about you that you're choosing that cheap art clip art? If you're making a presentation to an audience that you want to impress, you want to use imagery that will impress them. You want to use imagery that will match the sophistication of your audience. So in pre-production is the time that you want to think about what are the visuals that I want to put together? And how do, are my visuals going to speak to the audience that I have to say? You might change your visuals based on who your audience is. If your audience is full of film people, maybe you're gonna use clips from movies to illustrate what you're saying. If your audience is full of video game players, maybe you're gonna use video game footage to do the same things. Uh, you're creating visual metaphors and you're speaking to the visual sophistication of the audience. And only you is gonna know uh, what that uh, audience is looking for. But in pre-production is where you figure these things out. You don't want to stumble across these ideas after the fact. You want to come up with all of this before you've actually started to create the presentation. Another thing is expressing ideas and, and expressing ideas about data or information. A lot of times you're going to need to put together models or uh, infographics or charts and graphs. If you're the kind of person that can help people understand complex ideas, uh, then you're always going to be um, employed because that's a very special skill. So part of visual thinking is if you have complex ideas that you want to talk about, what are the visual analogs that you can create that can help people understand that? And that's something that takes work. That's part of pre-production that you've got to work through. There are elements of graphic design involved. You don't, all, you don't have to be a graphic designer to know that in your presentation, you need to communicate clearly and swiftly. Know that in a, a presentation, things move by fast. You don't want to um, have one slide with eight images on it that you hold on to for a minute. It, uh, as a general rule of thumb, I don't want anybody holding on to any particular slide longer than 20 seconds. After that, it becomes visually static and boring. So if you've got a lot of images, there's no need to create a collage. You can just have multiple images following each other. That's the beauty of a time arc. And it creates a tempo and a pace. And if you have text, 
make sure that you're not putting too much text on the screen at one time. Uh, a good way to think about it is uh, the way graphic designers have to deal with highway signage. If you're driving down the highway at 60, 70, maybe 80 miles an hour, and a sign comes by and it's got important information that you need to know, I hope they're not using, you know, uh, uh, gothic fonts and, and uh, uh, you know, weird patterns. I hope that you're using very clean, bright, thick fonts with good contrast so I can understand what's happening very quickly. Graphic designers know this. Graphic designers know that you want to use symbols when you can so that you're saving space. You want to use a few words uh, um, as possible so that people can understand what you're saying very quickly. Uh, if you're driving by, it's very important to know that this is my turn off. I don't want to have any complicated information there. And if your slide is coming by in eight seconds, you know, how fast is it going to have to resolve in the mind? So you want to think about not putting complicated quotes in there. You know, uh, people can read 10 or 12 words in uh, eight seconds. They can't read 30 words in a se eight seconds. So, you know, that, that paragraph long quote from Einstein might be good in the paper, but it's not going to be good in presentation. You have to choose what you're using to match the visual tempo and pace that you're, that you're taking your audience through. Uh, another aspect of graphic design is making sure that things are cleanly separated, that you're not running uh, text over photographs in which without any contrast so you can't read the text, that you're using uh, backgrounds and separators and, and you're uh, laying things out so that the audience can decipher this stuff very quickly because the slides are there to be deciphered as they're listening to you. If they, if they have to concentrate on deciphering or unpacking the visuals, they're going to stop listening to the voiceover. And that means that they've lost the narrative. So it's very important that everything be quickly, easily read. Motion design is something that I want you to think about. Now, with PowerPoint, it usually ships with, you know, 300,000 transitions and they're all very complicated and they're all very fun. But I'm not concerned about any of those. Transitions between slides don't have anything to do with your content. It's just Microsoft, you know, loading up the, the, the software uh, to be fun. But we don't want to be fun. We want to be understood. And so a lot of times those complicated transitions, you know, the curtain, uh, pulling back and forth or the fireworks exploding or the water rippling, all of that does is distract us from the show. And we don't want to be distracted. We want to be in the moment. So your slide transitions should be very quick. They should be cuts. They should be dissolves, should be pushes, things that happen very quickly. But there is motion design that I want you to be very focused on, and that is bringing in information as it's needed. There may be a moment in your slideshow in which you need to have five bullet points on the screen. There's five related thoughts that you're going to talk about. And you're going to design that as a single slide with five bullet points in it. But it's not necessary to bring it in fully formed at the beginning. You can start on a blank screen and bring and slide in point one. And then wait till you start to talk about slide point two before you slide that in. What is the advantage here? Well, you're keeping the audience in the moment. And that's very much a part of your responsibility as a, as a creative presenting artist. That you want to make sure that your visuals aren't taking people away from the moment, but they're keeping them in the moment. And so uh, doing things like subtle builds, where you're bringing in uh, the element that you, the audience should be focused on, just as it's being said on the soundtrack. You can do that in PowerPoint. It's very, um, it's very good at that sort of thing. And that's exactly the sort of thing that keeps the audience in the moment, just in time information. Uh, and so there are bits of motion design that help people understand. And that's what I want you to be thinking about planning ahead of time. 
and trying out. You're going to be doing lots of presentations. The presentation you do this month is one attempt. But you're going to see what a lot of your classmates do, and you're going to be able to have lots of chances later on as you're in your school career to do others. So uh, keep an eye out for presentations that you like and features in those presentations that you like. And uh, you can try them out later on your own next production. The final leg of uh, the ecosystem is delivery. It's how is this presentation perceived? And because we're defining presentation so widely that this really runs the gamut. Uh, you know, there is human interaction, a live room. And last week we saw a lot of TED Talks. So that's a theater with a presenter standing on a stage, an audience in theater seats. It's a very formal, very um, uh, ideal situation for a presentation. Uh, but there are lots of different uh, situations that you have to design for. Uh, the most common that you're going to end up designing for is the, um, the conference room at the place where you're going to work. This is usually a, uh, uh, an 8 by 10 or a 10 by 12 room with a, a long table in it, and maybe you got got 8 or 10 chairs around it, and uh, there may be 6 or 7 people in the meeting. And you may be presenting from a laptop or you lay on the middle of the table and play it from there. Or you may be playing from your laptop or your phone to a, a, uh, a flat screen TV on the wall or a projector. You know, but it's going to be a more intimate experience where you're standing or sitting at the table and you're probably looking every, each one of those people in the eye. So those are live experiences. Each one has its own dynamics and each one has different things that you have to plan for. We're creating something that is not live. It's going to be recorded. So it's going to use your voice and your visuals. We're going to lock them in, uh, ideally into a video, uh, or they can just be playing back as a PowerPoint. But there still is human contact. That's why it's required in this project that you use your voice. Your voice is the human contact in a pre-recorded video. So, uh, the, the, your voice is what has to connect with the audience. Now, some of you may be on camera, so you'll also have uh, your, your face, your, you'll have eye contact, you'll have hand expressions, facial expressions, uh, if you choose to be on video. But uh, at a minimum, everyone's going to be on the presentation as a recorded voice. And so the human element has to be there. We don't want to create an anonymous presentation. We want to make sure that we as the presenter are represented. And if we can't be in the room live, if it's pre-recorded, then our voice is that representative. And so if we are not there personally, then there are a variety of methods that uh, the presentation can reach the audience. And thinking about those devices, thinking about the delivery systems, is part of your job in pre-production. Is it something that you're gonna create and make a video and then put it on YouTube? In which case someone may see it on their computer or they may see it on their phone or they may watch it on a large screen TV. And how does your presentation scale up or down? If you create it on your laptop, you know, you have a 13, 14 inch laptop and the slides look terrific right there, but then they, the audience watches it on a phone, a three or four inch phone, did your scale, are your slides readable at that small size? Maybe they watch it on a, a, a 60 inch uh, flat screen TV and your images scale up. Do your images look good scaled up? Did you choose high resolution images so that as they move from one uh, size to another that they still look good? These are things you want to ask yourself that you want to plan on and plan around in pre-production because discovering that you made a mistake after the fact is not acceptable. You want to know that you're in charge of your production. So thinking about the way that your uh, project will be uh, delivered to your audience and the circumstances under which they're going to be seeing it are things that you have to think about. Sometimes you don't have control over it. Um, if you create a video and it goes on YouTube, they may be watching it on their phone in the subway and 
if audio is critical and they don't have their headphones, then, you know, maybe it's, they're lost to them. But you have to do the best you can understanding what the various circumstances of, of delivery can be. Uh, and as we move forward in time, there are going to be new ways of delivery. There are going to be large interactive screens that you may have to uh, figure out how to program for. We know that virtual reality and augmented reality are going to be a part of the communication systems of the future. So uh, maybe you're going to be designing messages that, that, that pop up uh, you know, in, in specific locations or, or uh, that uh, you're designing 360 degree presentations that people see in virtual reality goggles. We aren't there yet, but we know that that kind of technology is coming. So you want, as an artist, to keep an eye on what's coming up ahead so that you know that you might want to be able to uh, uh, future-proof some of the work you're doing. You know, if you know that resolutions are going to move uh, up to 4K and not, you know, uh, away from, from high def down, then you might know that you need higher quality images to be able to, to deal with the scaling. Um, you can't know what the future is going to be, but you can keep an eye on it and you can be uh, prepared for those changes. The final leg of the uh, delivery system is a kind of an odd term for us in the digital age. We tend to call it paper. Another way you could call it is the leap behind. And that is that once the presentation ends, it's something that runs in time. And you have to find a way for, for uh, the conversation that you've created with your presentation to continue. You have to find a way to get people to, to actively um, act on the yes that you just received. And so if you were in a, a, a live situation and you were trying to promote a cause or sell a product or something like that, you might have a designed presentation with a very specific look about it. And when the presentation was done, you might have created pamphlets with the same design that you hand out to everyone, or you might have business cards. And that you want to put those paper objects in people's hands so that if you're selling a product or you're trying to get people to sign up for something, or you're trying to get them to you know, uh, do some further action, that you've created a way for that to happen. And if you're having a digital delivery, and it's on you to think about what is next to that presentation that keeps the conversation going. Is there a web link? Is there a, uh, you know, Instagram handle? Is there some way that the audience can continue to get a hold of you? Uh, I know a lot of people think that if they put their phone number or their email address on the very last slide, that that's all they need to do. But I can guarantee you that when your presentation is running, there isn't a single soul who grabs their notebook and writes down your email address when it's on that last slide. The, the email address or the phone number runs for three or four seconds, it fades to black, and then it's gone. And you have to be able to know, why, how am I going to continue this? What is the lead behind? And again, these are things you want to think of in pre-production because you want to know that you've taken care of these issues. And at each point along the way, along this ecosystem, there's the chance to reflect and say, did I get it right? Should I change it? Can I make it better? And so on. And that's the process we're gonna go through in the next two or three weeks. So I mentioned brainstorming. Uh, when I tell you the, the, about the project you're going to create, I want you to all generate a lot of ideas for that project. I want to put them down on paper and turn them into me. That is the assignment for this week. So you're all going to go through a brainstorming process, thinking about all the cool stuff that you're going to put in your presentation. And there are rules for brainstorming. So I'm going to go through them right now. First rule, postpone and withhold your judgment of ideas. There's such a tendency to just Say, oh, well, that's good enough, and stop. Don't. Keep going. That's the one thing I want to impress upon everybody. If you're committed to brainstorming, if you're committed to generating ideas, then keep at it. Go further than whatever is comfortable. If you normally do it for five or six minutes, push it to eight. If you normally do it for 20 minutes, 
try to make it 30. Whatever your normal process is, push it further. And I guarantee you, you're going to have better results because the more, you're, the more you do, the more you're having options. It's not to say that the last idea is always the best, but you need to give yourself a variety of options. And so many people quit so early that they, they don't hardly ever have enough. So rule two, encourage wild, exaggerated ideas. There's just something about going crazy that the reaction, the bounce back from that usually becomes a really good idea. So we encourage wild, exaggerated ideas, not because you're always going to use the wild, exaggerated idea, but because in, in doing that, you somehow readjust your brain to come up with really good, refined ideas. It's almost as if there's a, there's a log jam in the back and you know the explosion of the crazy idea lets other things come. And I know we're mixing lots of metaphors here. Brainstorm means there's a meteorological event going on in your head. There's lightning and thunder, and you know uh, how are we gonna uh, how are we gonna uh, uh, break a logjam with lightning and thunder? But uh, I don't know. Uh, brainstorming is just a term that we've come up with. Uh, I really like the idea of ideation. It's the sister word of creation. The act of generating is to like the act of creating, uh, and that's what artists do. Number three, quantity counts at this stage, not quality. I want you to generate a lot of ideas. I want you to send me a, a, uh, a plan that's got a lot of stuff on it, hopefully more than you can use in your project. And then you can edit out the ones you don't like. But I want to see that you're doing this work. I want to see that you're thinking about a lot of things because that's going to tell me that you're in – a uh, good shape to get your project done. Now, these next two uh, rules aren't necessarily going to apply to you in this particular instance because these, they're, they're about brainstorming in teams. But once you guys go out into the working world and you, you start working at creative places, uh, the place where you work has group generating brainstorming ideas. And, and when you're Working in teams, there's a couple of extra rules. Rule number four, build on ideas put forth by others. So if you're in a creative team, you're not being proprietary about your ideas. You want the whole team to, to be better. So if someone says something, then you might want to build on that. If, if someone uh, builds on something that you said, they aren't being competitive or owning what you have to say. They're trying to push the entire team forward. So you have to sort of let go of ego a little bit when you're brainstorming in teams and realize that the entire team wins if everybody uh, contributes. And that leads to rule number five, every idea and every person has equal worth. And so if, you get, if you're get if you the, the newest person in a creative team and you have the best idea, then your idea can win. Uh, and that's just the way it is in a creative sphere. Now, not to say the world's a... a utopia uh usually the boss always thinks his ideas are better and the boss gets to pick so sometimes life isn't fair but if you're in a creative camaraderie and people recognize that you've had the best idea that's one of the best ways to get ahead in an organization that's built on creativity because people will see that you've got the goods and there is a sort of um, equality built on group brainstorming that is, is pretty magical at uh, a very creative company. So I want you all to go through this brainstorming notion. I'm gonna to get to the project in just a minute. Before I do, I wanna talk about the discussion that we're gonna do this week. The discussion this week is uh, very, it's a little bit complicated, but it's really fun. And it has to do with inspiration. When you get inspired by something and we all get inspired by different things some of us are inspired by films some by art some by literature some by video games some by sports but when you see something that just really affects you deeply how do you how do you transfer that passion along what tools do you have to communicate this this ardor that you have for a work of art that has moved you deeply. 
how can you uh, tell someone about what something means to you? That's the theme of this week's discussion. It's, we call it emotional storytelling. And uh, let me dump out of the, uh, the slides here and just get into the, uh, the project here. So in this week's emotional storytelling, uh, or in this week's discussion, we have a couple of videos that I want you to watch before you get started. So on the uh, first page of emotional storytelling, we actually have another TED Talk. I don't know if anybody ever chose this TED Talk. I don't think I saw it in, in the group that I read, that I uh, uh, graded this today. But uh, this fellow Jillian Treasure has done a TED Talk called How to Speak So That People Want to Listen. And it's about how to use your voice to be authentic. Now, for most of us, it's actually really hard to lie. When you are lying, you talk about something differently. You don't quite sound the same. That's why we have a running joke about used car salesmen. If we think the used car salesman is lying to us, we are never gonna believe what he has to say. So what is the opposite of that? What is communicating with sincerity and passion? Well, uh, Julian Treasure has identified something that he calls HAIL, H-A-I-L. It's honesty, authenticity, integrity, and love. And he believes that if you're communicating truthfully to one person to another, that people will hear that in your voice. And you want to practice being able to speak authentic, being able to say, uh, this is who I really am. Now, there are some people that can fake it, can fool you. There's great actors and actresses. But for the most part, we have to be telling the truth in order to really mean what we say. And it shows in our voice. And we have the ability to practice using our voice to communicate that kind of truth. So we want to practice this notion of hail this week. I want you all to communicate something that is near and dear to you. I want you to tell us a story. And uh, another thing that Julian Treasure brings up in his TED Talk is that we have this thing called the vocal toolbox. There are a couple of ways that we can vary our speech to help us reach this sense of hail. And so there's a, uh, a second video here that we've created called uh, a, a vocal toolbox, a quick explanation. Julian Treasure talks about it in the, in the video, and then we mention it, uh, go into it specifically. But they're very simple tools. You can speak faster or slower. You know, when you speak really fast, you sound excited. You're communicating that you're, you're just really enraptured. If you speak really slow, you sound perhaps sad or pensive. So if you want to communicate those emotions, you can vary your voice. You can move your voice up and down. You, uh, you can change the pitch. You can have dramatic pauses. And you can actually vary the way that you're, you're talking so that there is a rhythm that creates a sense of naturalness. So the vocal toolbox is something that's available to all of us. And it's something that uh, we use without thinking about it. But if we think about it, we can use it to a little bit better effect. And so I don't expect anyone to become an expert this week. But I want you to dip your toe in. I want you to think about the vocal toolbox. And I want you to do a recording of your voice and try to use some of these techniques and try to come across telling us a sincere story. So I said this is an emotional story uh, um, uh, project. If we go to the instructions, and remember the instructions are right here to be downloaded. So there's a PDF, that's, that is the instructions. And if you download it, it asks you to using the vocal toolbox and concepts of hail, Tell your audience a story centered around a piece of media that resonates with you. This can be a movie, song, video game, painting, sculpture, book. The options are endless. So 
the point here is that we've all encountered some piece of media that really moved us. A song that you'll always remember because it's when you fell in love, or there's a song that reminds you of your grandfather who died, or um, a movie that you'll always remember because there are, you know, connections to your life. And so I want you to tell us an emotional story. I want you to pick a piece of media that had moved you deeply. And I want you to talk about it. And I want you to tell the story of your connection to it. I'm not asking you to review the media. I'm asking you to tell me what is your connection to it. So uh, there's a lot of people that, you know, their lives have been transformed by video games. Uh, you know, uh, virtual fantasy or, or uh, uh, the rest of us. Those encounters are something that you can talk about and tell as a story. So we want you to tell us a two to three minute story. We're calling them, we're calling this week's initial post an audio visual project. So it's not a written fallout, it's not a written post, it's an audio post. You have to record audio. You can record video as well, you don't have to. Uh, so you can upload it, just an audio piece or you can create a, a piece of video and upload that. Sometimes that's even easier. And so on page three of the instructions, we talk a little bit about some of the uh, options here, uh, some programs you can use to record audio. You can use your phone to record audio. You can use your laptop to record audio. Um, if you wanna do a, a webcam, uh, the camera on your computer, on your laptop, you can just turn it on and, and record it and that will record video and audio as well. Uh, you can also use your phone to do um, uh, a webcam um, and so forth. So there are a lot of options. You can also use presentation software. Uh, and uh, there's one in particular that we recommend that's easy to use. It's called Adobe Spark. And so uh, that's in the instructions here. Now, if I come back to the uh, FSO page, if we go to the instruction, if we go to the discussion board, you'll see that I have already placed in the discussion board a couple of examples. So I'm gonna go through some of those right now. So um, the first example is a webcam. This is the easiest way to record yourself. Uh, if you're using a computer and your computer's all set up and the camera is in the right spot, then you have to make sure that you know what's on, what, what's, What's showing up in, in the vent? I don't want to see your, your mother ironing on the ironing board in the background or, you know, uh, a lot of other distracting stuff. If you're going to shoot the webcam, make sure that you've got a, a clean background that's not distracting. But you can then use your facial expression. You can actually use hand expression, etc. So uh, the first example I'm going to show you was put on uh, uh, YouTube. And Andy set up his camera and just uh, um, he had his camera set up so that he's just standing up walking around but it allows him to really be freeform talking and so this is a direct video webcast uh, and I want to show you that and then he put it on YouTube and we linked it back in here so we have the ability to take a YouTube link and put it in the discussion board and play it in line it looks very nice so let me show you this right now so Superman the movie, uh, that movie was made in, or was released in 1978. The first time I actually sat down and watched that movie, uh, I had to have been like five or six years old in that time area. Now, aside from things like great acting performances and casting, amazing technological leaps and bounds and filmmaking, having basically three separate movies in one single movie, aside from those things that I, I would generally say are reasons why it's my favorite movie, and the reason that I feel such an emotional connection to it, um, goes back to my dad. When I was little, when I was that little, uh, my dad was in the Navy and he was away overseas on deployment for long, for, for long periods of time. Now I'll, I'll, uh, let you guys watch that whole example on your own. The, uh, it's in the discussion board so you can watch it anytime, but I wanted to show you the setup. So Andy just set up his camera and he talked directly into it. It's got nothing really, uh, distracting going on in the background. And that's an easy way to record yourself uh, expressing yourself. Now you'll notice that Andy, who has some video editing skills, cut in 
stills of the movie as well. Now, I'm not asking you to do that. You can do that as well. You, you, you can perform at any technical level you like, but I don't want anybody to feel compelled to do something they don't know how to do. So if you don't know how to edit video clips into your webcam, then just do a straight webcam uh, direct. There's no need to have that extra stuff. Uh, it, it's just, uh, it's, it's what you want to do. But uh, this is the easiest way to do this. You can do this on a laptop. And you can do it on a phone. Uh, if you do it on a phone, make sure that you lock the camera down. Don't be holding the phone in your hand and moving uh, the phone around because that's a very distracting look. And so uh, one of the issues with a lot of you are going to find is just finding a place where you can do these recordings. Maybe your house is a, a little busy or noisy. Well, um, one thing I do recommend to people uh, uh, th that is a, a place that, that is an environment you can control is your car. Don't want anybody to do any recording while they're driving. But if you're sitting in your car by yourself, that's a quiet, controlled environment. And if you're at the driver's seat and you've got a steering wheel in front of you, you can lock a, a smartphone, rest it right up against the steering wheel, and you've got a, a stable camera, and you can shoot that very easily. And the audio is very clear. Uh, other places that you can try to find uh, where you can control the audio or control the, the noise in there is maybe a bathroom or a closet. If you go into a bathroom and it's got a lot of tile, that's gonna have a lot of bounce in it. It's gonna have a lot of uh, echo and reverb. That may be a sound, uh, uh, an audio sound that you like. If you go into a closet, there's lots of overcoats and blankets and you know a very muffled sound. And that uh, is a different kind of, of sound and it's probably very good for a confessional kind of video. But uh, depending on uh, you know what you have available to you, most of you have a multimedia setup already. If you're already a heavy gamer and you're using uh, 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 a headset with microphone on it and you have the ability to record that, uh, that'll work fine as well. So whatever you have that works is okay by me. Now again, it's not necessary to be on video. You don't have to show yourself. I just need to hear your voice. So if you can record audio only, you can do this up both with a phone. Phones have like voice memo apps on them that allow you to record audio. And um, there are, are different tools available on computers. Uh, if you're using a computer and you need an audio program, the one we recommend is Audacity. It's an open source tool that's available for Mac or PC and it's very simple to use, but it records audio and, and it gives you a lot of great features. So I wanna play you very quickly an audio only file. This is a, a fellow named Jim and uh, He's talking about a Bruce Springsteen song that ha had a powerful effect on him. And um, he, uh, I'm going to play it for a little bit. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to tell a story. So you don't have to go right into, here's my media. Uh, you, can, you can set it up. And that's what Jim has to do here. Let me play it for a minute. I remember getting to work a little late that day. I don't remember why I was late. Maybe I had an errand to take care of on the way to work. Or I was just running behind. My office was on the top floor of a six-story building, so I took the elevator up and walked off onto a floor which should have been loud and bustling on a Tuesday morning at nine o'clock. The first thing I noticed, though, was that it was eerily quiet. Just about everyone was gathered over in the corner, staring up at TV monitors that usually show business news and stock quotes on repeat. I saw one of my friends towards the back of the crowd, and I asked him what was going on. I hadn't listened to the radio on the way to work, and I hadn't seen the TV that morning at all. He said to me, two planes crashed into the World Trade Center this morning, not looking away from the TV monitor, which I just noticed showed two familiar buildings with black smoke pouring out of them. Even though I heard what he said. So in order to tell his story, Jim has to tell his recollection of what happened when he heard about uh, the attack on 9-11, 9 -11, 9-1-1. 9-11. Um, people of a certain age all know exactly where they were when they heard that. People of a previous age all know exactly where they were when they heard that John F. Kennedy got killed. There are these major life events that become frozen in time for people. 
Uh, some of you who were 19 might have been a little too young to experience this, but 9-11 uh, is a seminal event that most everybody can tell you the story of when they heard that. You know, your great grandparents can tell you the story when they heard that uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed. You know, it's just that kind of, of life event. And so uh, it's something that, that's ingrained in everybody. And when Jim heard a Bruce Springsteen song that was about firefighters in the Twin Towers working, he had this powerful sense of deja vu that brought him right back. And they, so he needed to, to set up the story that way. And so it's an interesting way to, to tell a story. And I'm saying this because there are a zillion ways to tell your story. Uh, and you have to find the way into your own. You have, may have to set up something a little bit ahead of time. You might go straight into uh, the, 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 the piece of media that you chose and then get to the relevance of it to you yourself. Uh, but you all can tell your own story. The last example I wanna show is Adobe Spark. This is an online tool from Adobe that uh, we highly recommend that you use. It's much simpler to use than PowerPoint. And it, uh, it's so simple that everyone who uses it for the first time can immediately start working with it. But it's very powerful. It allows you to express your ideas very quickly. And uh, you have to go to the Adobe site and create an account so that your work is saved, but then you're allowed to get your work off of that site and, and so forth. So this creates an MPEG-4 uh, that um, looks a little bit like a, a PowerPoint presentation type tool. And so the one, uh, last piece I'm gonna show you is from Danielle. And again, she takes a little bit of time to set up the media that she's getting into because she has to tell her own story. But again, she makes very good use of the kind of uh, visuals that a presentation tool allows you. Let me, let me play this for you. I think we all can agree that middle school is pretty awkward. It's filled with awkward preteens and their awkward bodies navigating their awkward social cliques. But despite all of that awkwardness, it's in these fragile middle school years that children really begin to piece together who they are and what they care about. It's in middle school where self-esteem seems to be teetering on a tightrope, waiting for a strong gust of wind to push it to one side or the other. And this issue of self-esteem was no different for me. It was in middle school that I realized that I did not fit in with the other girls in my class. I was all about basketball while they were all about nail polish. I hated skirts, but they were all into skirts. The effort that it takes to put on makeup depresses me, but the time crunch Oh dear, let's try that again. I think we all can agree to one side or the other. And I was all about basketball while they were all about nail polish. I hated skirts, but they were all into skirts. The effort that it takes to put on makeup depresses me, but the time crunch never seemed to bother the other girls in my grade. I knew that the things that my peers were turning to was not authentic to me, but I still felt the pressure to conform. I was a tomboy, and in many ways I still am, and in middle school that can be difficult to grapple with. I didn't fit into the socially constructed definition of a girl. I never got the guy. I never dressed up. I hate wearing heels. But one thing I did know was that I was in love with the game of basketball. It was in the seventh grade when I first saw what would become my all-time favorite movie, Love and Basketball. It was finally a movie for the tomboy, a movie in which the heroine didn't wear makeup, didn't like Again, I'll let you watch the whole thing on your own, but you can see she needed to build up who she was and what her situation was before she could bring in the movie that uh, connected with her, Love and Basketball. And I think you guys got a good sense of what Adobe Spark can do in, in terms of creating visuals that go along with your audio. And I think that with the three audio pieces that you heard, you get a, a sense of what I mean by hail. These people are com communicating their true selves. They're telling you a story. You don't think they're making anything up or they're lying to you. They, they, they're, they're, they're speaking from the heart. And that's what I want you guys to try to do, to tell a story, tell a story about your encounter with some piece of media. And that's the assignment. Uh, I, the last example I'm not gonna play, but uh, I did an audio only example about a movie that I like. Uh, one of my favorite movies, it's a John Wayne movie called The Quiet Man. And so it's an audio only piece, but since you can upload visuals here, um, 
I decided uh, just to put the uh, the movie poster up for context. So you can add a video, you can add a visual if you create an audio only piece. Uh, so there's plenty of opportunity that, that you can do that. And so when you're creating your initial post up here at the top, you'll see that there are tools on the far end right of the, the toolbar. You can add an audio file. This needs to be an MP, MPEG-3 audio file. Uh, but when you do that, it gives you an inline player. You can add an MPEG-4 video file. And when you do that, you get your own player like this. This is inline video playing from the discussion board. And you can also embed from another source uh, so if you go to YouTube or some other place where you're hosting your video, you can then put the embed code in here. And the advantage here is that you get the uh, traditional looking uh, um, YouTube interface playing in line. And then additionally, this is where you load a video. This is where you load an image up by itself. Um, and so you can, you can introduce your post and then add the media and upload it. And if it's a piece of media that doesn't fit in any of these, you can just do drag and drop. For instance, if you create PowerPoint, PowerPoints won't play online. So you would just drag them here. They'll be linked in. Someone can download it, watch it offline, and come back and respond. Uh, and, and there are different kinds of, of uh, audio or video that may not work. Uh, for instance, if you have an MPEG-4 audio file, you would just link that in. Uh, uh, drag and drop it in. If you have a, a QuickTime MOV file, you drag that in. But if you have uh, MPEG-3, it'll work to embed it. If you have an MPEG-4, it'll work to embed that. And I'll be around all week to help people get them loaded in. So that's the, that's the emotional discussion project. Before I go on to the main project though, I'm gonna open this up for questions here because usually you know, at this point, a lot of people are kind of spinning with their heads. You're thinking I asked you to do something you can't possibly do. You'll be surprised at, at how well you, this comes off, but this is usually a, a really creative, fun project for most people. Um, and we're gonna try to give you a little more time to do it. I think we're asking for you to have it up on Wednesday, but anybody that wants, or, or we're not asking you to have it up till Friday. So we're gonna give you a couple extra days to get the piece done, but I want everybody to try to have it up by Friday because in addition to the initial post, in addition to the audiovisual post, we want everybody to come back and respond to each other with text responses. So uh, that needs to happen by Sunday. So if everybody gets their audiovisual post up by Friday, then you can come in over the weekend and you can respond to each other and the two ways that you can respond are that you can talk about uh, their use of hail. Right? So each one's vo vocal performance you can, you can discuss with each other, or you can talk about their choice of, of media. You know, if someone wrote that they're into Neruda or the Harry Potter novels or whatever, and that's something you're into as well, then you can, uh, respond in posts about the media that they chose or their vocal performance. So uh, right now, if anybody has any questions, you can either type them in chat or uh, unmute yourself and uh, just ask a question. Is everybody good? Yes. Nobody's got a question for me. That frightens me. <laughs> I couldn't have done that good a job of explaining it. All right, but I, I, I don't be frightened by this because I think you guys are going to be fine at this. And believe me, the, the results end up being terrific. And you, you can't imagine how cool it is to see what your other classmates come up with. So uh, if you have questions about this later, you know, I'm going to be around all week. So there's no problem with that. So let's get back to the main project. This week's uh, main project is called planning an assignment or you know, uh, planning a project. And so the first thing you need to know is what is the theme? What is the project that we're doing for the rest of the week, the rest of the month? 
And that is, you're all gonna create a three or four min minute presentation with a voiceover in which you speak to your dream employer. You imagine that you've graduated. You, it's, it's projecting beyond full sale. It's projecting into the future. You've gained all the skills that you came here to full sale to acquire. Maybe you even worked at a couple of other places to get a little seasoning. But the company that you always wanted to work for all your life, the reason that you're, you know, you're here learning something, uh, you have the chance to work for Pixar or uh, Google or uh, Blizzard. Whatever company it is that, that you're really fixated on, you're going to have a chance to go up and ask them for a job. You've got four minutes. It's not an interview. It's a monologue on your part. And you're going to tell them who you are. You're gonna tell them what your skills you have. You're gonna tell them about your brand, who you are, how you got interested in what you're doing, how you gained your skills, what you have to do. And so you have to pick a particular company that you wanna work for. And you have to tell them the story of who you are and what skills you have. And that includes all the skills that you've gained from graduating from full sale meaning that you have to know what classes you're going to be taking and then you need to talk about some of them in the past tense as if you've already taken them. So here in the instructions, so remember, uh, the instruction sheet here is presentation plan instructions and the plan that I want everyone to turn in as a text file needs to include who is your target audience and that means what is the company that you want to hire you? Who are they? And tell me that you know something about them. I want to know that you know their culture. You have to know who your audience is in order to be able to reach them. Tell me what you know about that company. And what is your, what is your skill? What is your brand? What is your big idea? Are you a computer animator? Are you, um, you know, an audio producer? Are you a creative writer? Are you a, a film director? Are you a film cinematographer? What is it that you're seeking to do? And then what is your story? The beginning, middle, and end. Each This is where I want a lot of brainstorming. There should be multiple points for each one of these things. The beginning is where did you come from? Where did you get in, involved and excited in, in the art that you're you're studying? The middle how did you acquire your skills? What did you learn? Uh, and it, this doesn't include full sale alone. It's maybe you were, learned some stuff in high school. Maybe you were in the army. Maybe you have work experience. They all factor into turning into who you are. And finally, the end, the call to action. I need you to, at the end, talk directly to the company. Talk directly to Disney and say, I know who you are. I love your work. I I have your values, I want to join your team. You need to make that ask. It's something that's part of this presentation. The call to action, the talking directly to the employer and saying what you want to do. So in the end, you're gonna create a presentation, three to four minutes long. It's gonna have a voiceover throughout and you're gonna add slides to it. But this week, you're simply creating a text document that tells me all these items so that I know that you're prepared to do your production next week. So all I'm looking for is uh, the plan, the text file. And you have a lot of uh, variety for how to create it. Let me show you some examples. Um, let's see. Always lots to click through. All right. Um, so here is a Word doc that uh, is sort of in outline fashion. This guy's applying to Blizzard, and he's telling about his different interests. He's talking about the skills that he has, he's talking about his message, future self, uh, these kinds of things. So um, don't save. There are a lot of different ways to create these documents. Um, this one is in sort of paragraph fashion. So you can do it in outline form or you can do it in, in, in paragraph fashion. This person is uh, um, planning to work at Naughty Dog 
and he's telling me what he knows about Naughty Dog, tells me about the skills that he wants to sell. He talks about his beginning, his middle, his end, and so forth, what classes he's taken. So another thing that I need you all to do is to go onto the Full Sail website and look at your full list of classes. If you've never done this yet, this is the first time to do it. You go to fullsail.edu and you go find your degree program. So uh, somebody shout out a degree program that you're, you're studying. I'll show you how to find it. Creative writing, bachelor's. Okay. So um, that would be in, Creative Writing Bachelors. So if I click on that page for that and go down to the page, you're gonna see that there's a, a, a syllabus here. It's an arrow, campus and online. So if you're online, it's a 29 month bachelor's for creative writing. And if I click on that, you're gonna have a listing of every single class that you're gonna be taking. You're, our, you're a number one right now, creative presentation. Next, next month, you're in psychology of play. And all the way down, you need to see these are the classes. Now, I don't want in your presentations that you just list six or eight and you just list the names. I took this and I took this and I took this and I took this. Pick one or two, maybe three, that had a huge impact on you. The class you're looking forward most, genre fiction. Now, I love horror, whatever. But then tell me what you learned from it. So don't just name check it. Talk about the class. Tell me what skills, values you learned from that class. And you can get a description of each one. So like uh, if, you're, if you're wanting to write for children's books, here's a, a, a class on children's entertainment. I click on it and I have a course description. So you guys can all go online and find your class. Uh, so that's part of the research that I want you to do this month, the week. The reason this week is a planning week is that you're doing research. If, I, if you've never thought about who you want to work for, then you need to think about that. I mean, maybe you say, I want, to be an audio I want to be an audio engineer, but I don't have a clue who to work for. Well, there's some ways to work through that. Let's say you live in St. Louis, and you want to be an audio engineer, and you want to stay in St. Louis. You don't want to move to another city. Well, maybe you need to find out what audio studios there are in St. Louis right now that you might be able to work for. That's some research that you can do. So think about the job that you want to have and think about uh, a specific employer. I don't want you to be vague about this. I want you to pick one person. There may be multiple places you want to work, but you need to just pick one for this project and focus on them, research them so you know who they are. You need to know who your audience is. And that's part of what I'm asking for for this assignment, that, that you've done the work of knowing who your audience is. And now there are a lot of different ways to um, put your plan together. If you're visually oriented, there are things called mind maps that are for visual folks. And they're a lot like word outlines, only they're much more visual. But the same stuff is here. This is planning a presentation, and here we have the beginning, middle, end of his story. We have the company that he wants to work for. He wants to work for Bethesda Games, so that's his target audience. And here is a lot of information about Bethesda that he's telling me so that I know he knows who Bethesda is. And the big idea is, what is your brand? Do you want to be a computer programmer? Do you want to be a game level designer? Do you want to be a composer? Uh, you want to talk about the skills. You want to talk about where you gain those skills. So uh, mind maps are something you might want to use. It's a little more free form. Some people just do sketches, notebooks, and so forth. This guy did his whole thing on Post-its and put it on the wall. And he photographed it, and this is fine. Now, when I say this is fine, note that I can read every single word he's written here. If you're going to do something handwritten, Ask yourself, can Daryl read it? And if you're not sure, then the answer is no, and then I want you to type it up. But if your handwriting is very clear, then you could give me a scan from your notebook. You can give me something like this that's 
you know, cool and free form, however you like to work. I don't want to cramp your style. And maybe you haven't thought about, you know, how you brainstorm or how you, how you make plans or notes. So this is a chance to try a couple of different tools out. And again, like last week, I'm happy to share some of these plans with folks. There's no, no earthly way that you can copy someone else's dream. So, uh, you know, if I give you a layout uh, option, it wouldn't have anything to do with what you're going to say in terms of content. Um, is there any way that you can email me a, um, a copy of the mind map? I really like that. Sure. Just uh, go right on to uh, down here and the feedback say, Mr. Moore, can you send me a mind map and you'll get one right back. Okay. Feedback on the, on the FSO site is the easiest way for me to send the files back to people. So okay. ask for variety, ask for something specific. I'll, I'll give it to you. No problem. Um, and, and, and some people like to have fun with it. Uh, there's a girl here um, who wanted to be a graphic designer. And so uh, she, let me see if I can find it. She did her plan like this. She wants to work for Disney. And uh, I can imagine Disney being pretty, pretty, uh, uh, impressed by this but she's got all the information I asked for and she's just showing me that she's got some graphic designer skills etc so you don't have to do that you don't have to include visuals if visuals are important to you and they're part of what you want to collect then please put them in this is a brainstorming planning session this week uh, a lot of times people can use things like Pinterest to gather visuals together uh, if you're doing a lot of web searching and so forth so uh, you have until Sunday to turn in the plan. So take as much time as you want. I want you to be thinking about this stuff, thinking it through, planning it out, putting as many ideas down as possible. And uh, you know, you give me your plan next Sunday and then the very next day you're gonna start building it. So uh, that's the way it's gonna work. This is the research phase. So this is the chance for you to figure out what classes you're gonna be taking, you know, and uh, you know, what kind of companies there are uh, some of you are going to want a little bit of help figuring out uh, who to pick as a company. Contact me. I can work with each of you individually. And there are people who are going to say, I want to work for myself. I'm going to allow that. But the deal is, if you're, if you're running your own company, then the, the project you're making is that you're, you're adding, you're, 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 um, you're recruiting to add more to your company and the audience that you're choosing are investors. So you have to tell them about the company if you're on, you still have to tell them all who you are and what your education and past was. You have to talk about yourself as much as you talk about as everybody else does. You don't get to hide behind the company you create, but you can talk about the company that you created, but you're trying to get investors to, to give you money to enlarge your company. Uh, most people, if you want to work on your own, I still highly recommend that you just choose your dream company. Because one of the things you want to do is gain enough experience that you can run your own company. So maybe you want to work for Disney, but you also want to work on your own. Then choose Disney and tell Disney that someday you want to have your own business. There's no reason you can't uh, make that part of your life plan. But certainly having worked for Disney makes you much better running, running your own company than if you never did. So uh, very much think about choosing a dream employer, even if it's not your first choice. Uh, if you're a music person and you want to be a, a music artist, try to find a label that fits who you are. Uh, you know, uh, a, a music company whose, whose musical style fits your own. Uh, if you're a uh, uh, sports person and you want to be a sports cast, take a sports casting job, there are lots of local sports casting jobs that you can fit into. And all you need to do is think about what it is you really want to do. And you can always find uh, someone to pitch your skills to. So uh, anybody that needs help figuring out their dream audience, get a hold of me. I'll, we'll have a short discussion. I can, I can, uh, 
put you on the right track. So that's what I'm looking for. You got two assignments this week that are both very creative, that are both very fun. You're gonna take a lot of your time and uh, that's a good thing. You're here at school and uh, this is your chance to be creative. Now, uh, any more questions about the planning assignment? Uh, anybody that wants uh, examples, just send me a note. I'll, I'll, I'll send you the examples, but anybody that wants to uh, have any questions about what you're looking for or what you need to be thinking about, uh, anybody have a question right now? No. All right. No. <laughs> So I'm gonna let you guys go. Uh, uh, this recording will be up in about an hour. So it'll be up available all week if you need to come back like and, and double check it. And uh, if you have a question, just contact me directly. And uh, uh, you guys have a great week. Thanks a lot.